Okay, hello everyone and uh, uh, welcome uh, to our program for today. My name is Keith Robinson. I'm a professor at the SMU Debman School of Law and co-director of the Thai Center for Law, Science and Innovation. It's my honor to welcome you to our program today. The Thai Center is an academic center at the law school that focuses on legal issues related to science and technology. This semester, the center is sponsoring a series of talks to discuss the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on the legal landscape. Before I introduce our speaker, there are a few administrative matters that I wanna mention. First, attendees can submit questions to be answered at the end of the session using the Q&A feature at the bottom of the screen. Second, uh, the information uh, to complete your CLE will be provided to you at the end of uh, our session today. Our speaker for today is Professor Pamela Metzger. Professor Metzger is the director of the Decent Criminal Justice Reform Center and a professor of law at the SMU Dedman School of Law. Her scholarship combines theory and practice in seeking improvements in criminal justice. Professor Metzger's work has appeared in prominent national law review journals and has been widely cited by leading authorities and by the US Supreme Court. In addition to directing the center, she teaches criminal law and professional responsibility at the law school. Today, she's going to be talking about criminal law in the time of COVID. Uh, welcome, Professor Metzger, and I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you for having me, Keith. Sorry about that. Took me a minute to find my unmute button. Um, and welcome, everybody. Um, let me begin by just um, making a couple introductions about who I am and what I do. I know Keith was gracious enough to introduce me, but I want to take a minute and introduce the Deason Criminal Justice Reform Center, which um, some folks may not be familiar with. Um, so let me begin by kind of describing a little bit about what the center does and our areas of expertise, and that will help frame up this conversation that I'm hoping we can have. And I am hoping that this will be interactive, that we'll have some questions and some opportunity to discuss maybe what folks' experiences have actually been um, in this new digital age. So um, the Decent Criminal Justice Reform Center is about three, and three years old, and we focus on three areas. Uh, the first is on public defense. We look at both public defense systems, so the methods by which we deliver public defender services, and we also look at the individual delivery of services and ask some of the questions that probably people are most familiar with in a legal context. Those being questions about the quality of the defense that's provided, the quality of services that should be expected under the constitution and remedies for situations when either caseloads are high or services are substandard. So that's our first and primary area of focus. Our second area of focus is in the area of prosecutorial discretion. And here we're talking particularly about the area of prosecutorial discretion in making charging decisions. So when cases come into a court, prosecutors have the opportunity to make decisions about charging. And we are exploring in a number of jurisdictions how and why prosecutors make their decisions. Finally, we are going to be taught, we focus on something called star jurisdictions. Those are small tribal and rural communities that have been largely left out of the criminal justice conversation in our country. Um, and so we, we've prioritized bringing those communities into focus. Um, we've held what was the first national um, summit on that that brought in multiple stakeholders from different communities. And you'll be, I think, unsurprised to hear that one of the big topics of conversation at that event, as it has been with public defenders and lawyers elsewhere, one of the big topics has been um, what one does with technology. All of that, of course, has been heightened um, in the time of COVID. And so what I'd like to do is prevent, present a little bit of an overview um, about what we know about data and technology during the time of COVID, and um, then talk a little bit about what we can expect to see in terms of questions and litigations about criminal justice and particularly criminal justice services on the procedural side. So let me begin by talking a little bit about data. Um, what we know, at least um, preliminarily, is that crime tends to be on the decline right now. There's some evidence that crime is declining from the number of 911 calls that come in. Those are significantly decreased. Um, from the arrest data, which is also declining. 
And um, much of this is coming from urban jurisdictions with large data collection capacities. Uh, what, we, what we also know is that there are significant data limitations. Um, and so as people have started to use big data to gather this information, by which I mean harvesting information from online jail rosters, um, compiling data produced um, through those systems that provide monthly reports, um, we do see trends diverging from jurisdiction to jurisdiction. Um, but criminologists are beginning to develop some theories based on the data about what we're seeing. And the most prominent theories um, that I just want to kind of highlight for you, because it's too preliminary to know whether they're going to hold, um, are that we have disrupted routine activities through stay-at-home orders, uh, that we have altered peer dynamics as a result of stay-at-home orders, and in particular, school closures, work closures, and that there have been, because there are smaller crowds and fewer people out and about, diminished opportunities to commit crime. Now, bearing all of that in mind, there are certain notable exceptions that we're seeing in the trends. Again, these are the data that we're seeing, um, too early to know whether they will hold um, across time. Um, serious batteries don't appear to be on the decline. Homicides do not appear to be on the decline. And intimate partner violence is at least anecdotally on the rise, in part because of the compression of time and space where people are spending their time. So that's kind of what the data tell us um, about crime trends. What we need more of, and what I think we're going to see as the big national data sets start to come in, are nationally representative data, self-reported data, which is collected at intervals, it's not real-time collections, um, and ancillary data sources that help fill out our knowledge about crime. Those ancillary reports are things like retail reports on incidences of shoplifting, hospital reports on trauma. So we'll need those additional data sources to really help us understand what's happening in crime. Future research obviously will be on questions about the pandemic and what it tells us about crime. And here again, I think data is going to be incredibly important in three ways that I think are worth at least acknowledging as data specific in, in an era of big data. One is we're going to be able to parse out specific types of crimes and distinguish them. That alone wouldn't make this so different, but there are two new characteristics that we're going to be able to consider um, through the use of modern technology, such as GIS mapping, spatial um, identification. We'll be able to see location changes in crime and arguably using location finders and what we know about people's travel and movement from cell phones, we'll be able to start mapping crime spatially against the other factor here, which is the temporal restrictions that are provided. So we can imagine, we don't know for sure, that we might see a sharp decrease in certain kinds of time crime at the beginning of a lockdown we might see those crimes start to move up slightly if people start to either relax restrictions or restrictions start to become taken less seriously. And then we, again, we might see other kinds of crime remain relatively constant throughout the pandemic. And at least one hypothesis there is that, for example, juvenile crimes um, associated with peer group behavior, so low level offenses um, that one might associate with kids hanging out after school, those tend to disappear, at least hypothetically, because school isn't in session. So we'll be watching those trends across time and analyzing them. Um, a key point to keep in mind as we conduct that analysis, and I say we, the Decent Center won't do it, but criminologists are, um, it is asking whether and to what extent these changes are urban, suburban, or rural. And bearing in mind that crime really will look different as it does now across those three geographic regions. So that's kind of what we can tell about what the data show us about crime. What the data show us about incarceration, uh, again, preliminary, but quite interesting. Um, we see fewer arrests, which one might expect, given that I just told you that we're seeing a decrease in lots of crime. We are seeing declining jail populations. Again, we might expect that based on a decrease in crime. Um, and we're seeing bail and early release, which are arguably unrelated to the decrease in crime. If you look at the data, um, the arrest 
decline and the declining jail populations are much greater in magnitude. Um, it's particularly on the arrest side um, than is associated with the decline in crime. Um, and, and what that correlates to, at least again, these are preliminary numbers and, and we're hypothesizing at this point, it is the fact that um, since the beginning of the pandemic, policing behaviors have changed. So in other words, crime may be staying the same in some areas, but police are responding differently to it. Um, if you look, for example, at what policing expectations are right now, police are encouraged to engage in arm's length communications when possible in many jurisdictions um, to communicate by phone or video. Summonses are favored rather than bringing people to jail because of what we know about the high risk of infection during incarceration, as well as because people are concerned about officer safety and officer infections. Um, bail and early releases, both on the front end, people who are accused of crimes, and on the back end, people who are serving sentences, um, those are up. We see judges and sometimes correction staff, depending on the jurisdiction and the executive authority there, releasing people and releasing them earlier and more often, um, again, as a matter of public safety and infection control. So the, the incarceration trends don't just track what we see um, in terms of declining arrests and declining service calls, um, but they suggest as well changes in policing patterns. And one of the questions that we as a society are gonna to have to ask at the conclusion of the pandemic and when we see what crime looks like throughout the duration uh, of the pandemic and our associated lockdowns is we'll have to ask how much of our pre-pandemic incarceration was necessary, how much of our pre-pandemic incarceration was useful. And some of that will be driven by our understanding of what happened with people who were released and released either early um, or were simply provided with the summons and never taken to jail. So those are questions that we're gonna be keeping our eyes on and that hopefully data will soon be able to help us understand. Um, I wanna turn now to technology trends um, in terms of what's going on in courts and talk a little bit about what's happening there. And I'm hoping that, that once I do that, um, the audience will jump in with conversations um, about your questions about what's going on in courts and what's going on in criminal process. You know, it's not a secret that the big trend in criminal justice now is the importation of technology into almost every aspect of criminal procedure. Let me begin by saying that's not new. Um, it's long been the case that courts have used video conferencing, for example, to conduct initial appearances, to do bail proceedings. It's long been the case that some courts will allow telephone appearances. There are places like Arizona, for example, where if you live more than 100 miles away from the court, you're allowed to plead guilty by telephone. There's also been a trend toward online dispute resolution, which in the criminal context means being able to pay your fines and fees online and or um, being able to enter a guilty plea postpone a court date, et cetera, um, there are some substantial questions I think to be answered about what that means in terms of constitutional rights and the availability of counsel. But ODR again has been trucking along even before the pandemic. Um, and of course, e-filing with which most people are familiar with um, was also happening and happening in a lot of places. Certainly it's now the standard in federal courts and in many urban jurisdictions. So what did the pandemic do that was different? What we saw in the pandemic was that the necessity of social distancing left courts really with two choices. They could halt operations, incur a large backlog of cases, and really start to grapple with tough questions about constitutional rights, including particularly the speedy trial right that most states have as a state right that is always there as a federal constitutional right or they could begin to embrace technology and try to use technology to help address those problems. So where do we see courts going with this? Well, we see courts initially moving to institute video conferencing procedures, um, really everywhere from initial appearances through to sentencing, and most recently in jury trials, jury selection and jury trials. 
The second place that we see technology making an entry is in the attorney-client relationship, or if you're a prosecutor, um, the prosecutor-witness relationship. Um, many of those communications are being carried out by video. Um, there are significant concerns that I'm going to come back to about what that means, but that's kind of the second area. So we have court proceedings, we have attorney practice outside of the courtroom. And lastly, we have the area of supervision. And in supervision, we're really talking about diversionary programs, about pretrial release and monitoring, about the supervision of probationers, and sometimes even the payment or resolution of fines and fees. And in each of these places, I think there are causes for us to stop and to give serious thought about whether the technology, one, is doing what we need it to do, and two, whether we know what we need to about what the technology is doing. And I think that will lead us to make some better decisions, I hope, um, when we come to the other side of the pandemic, because there's every indication that many of these technological adaptations will last. In fact, if you look at the Supreme Court orders that have been issued in every state, um, they all address technology. And many of the more recent orders issued by state Supreme Courts are very explicit in noting that some of these pandemic adaptations are here to stay. So with that in mind, I want to talk about a couple of issues that I think are of concern. And again, I hope you guys will um, chime in with questions because uh, this is a really, I think, the kind of conversation that's most useful when people who are thinking and working in the field have an opportunity to share their experiences, or we can at least brainstorm together or think about um, what the issues are that might be coming up. So the first and most obvious concern is clearly the digital divide. And it's not simply a digital divide about which areas of the country have access to the internet and which don't, although that is important. Um, right now, the FCC reports that if we have about 22% of rural areas in the United States do not have access uh, to the internet. In tribal communities, the number goes up to more like 25 or 26% of the community lacks access to internet technology, which means that if you don't have an internet signal, you cannot take advantage of any of the technological innovations that are happening in courts. That's both a problem on the individual level, so for individual litigants or lawyers who do not have access, but it also raises really significant questions about parity within a given jurisdiction. What happens if Courthouse A in an urban area is able to use and implement the technology, Courthouse B in a rural area is not. They're both governed by the same state statutes. Defendants in both locations have equal rights to due process. And it raises questions in part about the allocation of state funding. And I think we can expect to see in general as a result of the pandemic, and in particular as a result of the nexus between the pandemic and the digital divide, an increased pressure for funding of broadband technology in rural and tribal communities. So you've got the question of a digital divide geographically. We also have a digital divide economically. Um, as many of you may know, many of you may be experiencing this, we have children studying at home. We're using up their family's uh, broadband length, right, the bandwidth on their schoolwork. Um, we may be putting families or people in the position of having to choose between whether their kids can go to school or they can appear in court. We may have individuals who simply cannot afford data plans that allow them access to the kind of technology for the length of time that they'll need to participate in criminal justice proceedings. And we may have folks who are at risk because of that limitation of making other sacrifices in terms of their family and personal lives. And we are imposing, arguably, fairly significant costs for participating in the process, which at least if you're a criminal defendant, is not a process you ask to be involved in in the first place. Now we have seen some courts make efforts to deal with this. Uh, notably Arkansas, very early in the process of thinking about technology. Arkansas is one of the very few states that has invested effort into making sure that individuals have access to technology. Arkansas has done that by gathering um, identification of hotspots and free Wi-Fi where they are available 
and publishing those. Now, of course, where are they published? On the website. But it does mean that lawyers um, who have access are able to communicate with their clients, presumably by phone, uh, with witnesses, with victims, with the public, which has a right to um, attend and participate in trials, um, or at least getting communication about access, individual access to the technology. There's a third piece of the tech um, divide that has to do with the quality of the technology. And this is someplace where I'd like to pause for just a minute and, and talk about some of the ways in which the quality of technology influences the experience we have of justice. So the easiest example is to think about what happens when you have a bright light focused on someone with a very dark complexion. You lose much of your ability as a viewer to identify facial expressions. When you have low quality video, you may flatten the affect. Low quality sound does that even more. It may appear, for example, that someone's speaking without affect, that makes them sound indifferent when in fact it's a bandwidth problem. There are lighting issues. If any of you have talked to your teenagers lately and they all want a ring light so that they look better on camera, um, you know that this is something everybody is thinking about because none of us like to look at ourselves on the screen, but it's that much worse when the quality of the video communication inhibits the ability of the viewer to make really meaningful, meaningful decisions about the candor of the person speaking, about the integrity of the communication, about the authoritativeness of the communication, much of our criminal justice system is based on the very notion of communication in a face-to-face -face way. A defendant has the right to confront his or her accusers. A defendant has the right to be present in a courtroom. The jurors look at the defendant and observe the defendant throughout the trial. They observe the demeanor of the witnesses. And the lawyers look at how the jurors feel. Right? The lawyers look to seek clues in what's happening with a juror. Video really challenges us in our ability to maintain those conventions of practice. Video similarly has proved enormously challenging um, in policing and confessions. There have been efforts, for example, separate and apart from the pandemic to measure what the quality of video is in confessions and how that affects a viewer um, who's making a decision about the authenticity or the voluntariness of the confession. That problem is now magnified every time a criminal defendant or a witness or a juror who's appearing in voir dire um, is asked to make a statement um, or is asked to answer a question. So the quality piece um, is someplace where we should be enormously concerned about what quality does to our perception of content. Now, unfortunately, we don't know enough about this. In fact, we know very, very little. Uh, there was one study, one major study conducted in Chicago in the late 1990s when Chicago went to doing bail hearings by video. Bail hearings are sort of interesting because typically a defendant does not speak. If they do, it's to provide basic information. Um, it's mostly an argument about pretrial release and it's a lawyer's process. And yet the data from that experiment in Chicago showed that defendants who appeared on video for their bail um, saw their bail amounts increased up to 50% more than those who were appearing live in court, in the same court with the same judges and the same prosecutors. That study was conducted based on things that happened in the late 1990s and early 2000s. There has been almost no additional study since then. And yet across the country, people are making those decisions based on video. Now I wanna emphasize, this is not new. If any of you have followed the lawsuits in Dallas or in Houston or anywhere else in the country, about early stage procedure and pretrial release. You'll be familiar with the phenomenon of a defendant's first appearance in court being via video. 
You might also be familiar if you've had a chance to watch the videos out of Dallas um, with the fact that many of those video appearances last two to three seconds, four, five, six, seven seconds. Um, there's no real meaningful communication. Um, often in these video communications, attorneys are in one room, a defendant is in another. I'm gonna come back to that in a minute. But what the pandemic then has really done is it surfaced these early stage uses of video, primarily in initial appearances and bail, made them common across the country and has advanced them to witness-based hearings, voir dire, jury trials, probation interviews, sentencing. And so I think there's really a, a, a very strong imperative on us to be studying what this means. Unfortunately, a pandemic and a national crisis is probably not the best environment in which to study and assess the impact of video. There are too many things happening at once. Very difficult to tease out what decisions are being driven by COVID, what decisions are being driven by the impact of video, what decisions are being driven by the changed circumstances in which everyone finds themselves. So the my, my cautious hope is that at the end of the pandemic, we will go back to our live in-person proceedings with some randomized controlled trials of video, and we will see what happens. But I will say that what I'm hearing from the courts, what I'm reading in Supreme Court orders, in judicial statements, is a sense that somehow we're now on the train to all tech courts, that that train is pulled out of the station, it's moving and nothing's gonna stop it. And for reasons that I'm about to talk about, I think there are other concerns besides simply digital divides and video quality. So let me turn next to, to this question of using video for supervision. We have seen in the past um, some really well-documented studies of telemedicine. Um, telemedicine has actually been used very effectively, including telepsychiatry. And so I think we can be cautiously optimistic that perhaps it will have beneficial therapeutic uses in criminal justice in cases where the communication is therapeutic. So you might imagine in diversionary programs where people are being getting treatment in probation or parole supervision where someone might be getting services. Um, in an ideal world, those would be therapeutic interactions and we would be able to use what we know about telemedicine to really enhance the services that are being provided. Um, again, this is something that's already in use in some rural areas and has been a great boon um, in places where probation officers may have to cover hundreds of miles of territory or where a person who is being diverted out of the criminal justice process um, might need to rely on video to do the therapeutic work that's required as a condition of having charges dropped. So there's some evidence that it works in the criminal justice system. But again, there are very significant concerns that we just don't know enough about. And it's not just the digital divide that folks are dealing with. It's concerns about the privacy of the people who are communicating by video, for example, and the privacy of the people they're with. If you imagine, for example, a probation supervision meeting by video or a probation violation hearing by video, if the probationer is in his or her home, who else is walking by in the home who might not be consenting to participate? What's being missed or overlooked in the communication that's picked up in a one-to-one in -a -one body language meeting? And what happens when technology fails? So we're all relatively familiar with the use of monitoring technology, for example, electronic ankle bracelets. Um, and those are relatively reliable. We can have a conversation about why it is that they cost so much, but we know how that technology functions and we have well-established protocols for what to do when a signal disappears, when, a, when an ankle monitor seems not to work. What does one do? when someone who's required to report by video does not appear? How do we know whether that's a failure to appear, 
or whether it's someone who can't pay their cell phone bill? How do we know whether it's a willful choice to avoid the order, show up and speak to your probation officer, or a data problem? How do we know whether the internet is even available in their area at that moment? And how would we prove it? So there are logistical problems as well with instituting these kinds of supervisory strategies. But I think the big kahuna here um, is really when we think about the work that lawyers do. Um, I had the privilege of being on a couple of um, brainstorming conversations, roundtables, um, with lawyers who think about small tribal and rural spaces. And, and a district attorney said, you know, I love video, it's terrific, but you have to earn it. And I said, what do you mean? And he said, well, he said, I can't just turn on the camera and expect a uh, victim to talk to me. I've got to be willing to get in my car and drive and sit down with that person face to face and say, tell me about what happened. And it's only when I've earned trust that I've earned the right to sit back at my office and put the video camera on. And I think most criminal defense lawyers that I've spoken to say the same, that there's nothing that replaces the quality of personal interaction and that the very act of appearing, of showing up, says something about the lawyer's commitment to the person on the other side of the table. Pandemic means we can't do that. There's the process by which our criminal justice system operates, namely an adversary system in which people come together, something we can't really do anymore, and duke it out about evidence and witnesses. Right now in courthouses across the United States, courts are trying, for example, to set up courtrooms where witnesses appear by video and everyone has to wonder, are they being coached? Is there a piece of paper stuck up in front of the computer? I mean, for all you know, I'm reading off of one right now. How do we know that we're getting unadulterated testimony from the witness, him or herself, rather than coaching from someone who we can't see who's off camera? Yes, there are technologies that can scan a room, um, you've heard probably about some of those being used in exams, sometimes the bar exam, sometimes law school exams, but those are expensive, they're complicated, and courts have not adopted them. So we've got the problem of trying to assess witness credibility. We also have problems associated with jury selection, something I never thought I would be talking about in the context of doing remote proceedings, but that's the direction we seem to be going in. So imagine a voir dire process. Imagine having to voir dire 100, or as we say in Texas, I guess voir dire, um, 100 jurors maybe on video. Part of the voir dire process is asking something to juror number one, but keeping your eyes out for what numbers two, three, four, five, six. How are they responding to your questions? That's lost. What about the defendant's right to be present and see how jurors are responding to him or her? We've lost the ability to look at jurors' body language. Jurors may not even be able to look at the defendant and defense counsel and the prosecutor all at the same time, depending on the setup. So there are enormous questions about video technology and its ability to have fair voir dire. Now the alternative, which is equally problematic, is to have jury selection socially distant, but in person, which presents serious questions about the composition of a jury pool, since almost every court is prepared to excuse people who are at high risk, namely older people, people who are immune compromised, people who come from certain uh, communities where there is a widespread incidence of the virus, maybe actually asked to stay home. So the alternative to technology may appear to be a skewed jury pool. That leaves us with a pretty lousy set of choices and I don't know that anyone has a great answer. Another place where technology is really challenging our fundamental sense of what American criminal justice looks like is with the very notion of the defendant's presence at trial and presence at other procedures. In courts across the country that have made the decision 
to stay open remotely, defendants are being asked to appear in court by video and frequently their lawyers are appearing by video in another room, in another place. That's damaging, I think almost anybody would agree, not just to the attorney-client relationship, but to a defendant's ability to communicate with a lawyer in the process of trial. Um, anyone who's watching who's ever tried a case with a defendant sitting next to them knows what that tug on your sleeve feels like. There is no video equivalent of a tug on the sleeve. Anyone who's ever tried a case and had a defendant sitting next to them knows what it's like to see or feel your client right next to you responding to something that just got said in the courtroom and knows what it's like to take that as a signal that you either need to ask more questions or go in a different direction, not because they're signaling something improperly, but just because you're there with your client and they have the right to communicate with you. Confrontation. What does confrontation look like? Again, confrontation looks like jury trials now. We seem to have this Hobson's choice. We can have witnesses testify with masks on. Not clear to me that that satisfies the confrontation requirement. Or we can try to do remote confrontation by video, something that is of really dubious constitutional merit. In fact, there are, I think, very good reasons to argue that the confrontation clause unilaterally precludes it. But all of those concerns are colliding right into another constitutional imperative that technology cannot address, and that's the speedy trial clause. The speedy trial clause is not built in a way that allows for a great deal of nuance. Speedy trial clause, we make four inquiries to decide whether there's a constitutional violation. We ask about the length of the delay. We ask about the reason for the delay. We ask how vigorously the defendant has sought a speedy trial. And we ask about prejudice to the defendant. Prejudice takes three forms. It's the anxiety of the prosecution itself hanging over the defendant. It's the injury worked by pretrial detention or by a non-custodial supervision order, like conditions of bail. And it's the damage to the case. It's the damage to the defendant's ability to defend him or herself. The remedy, and it's the only remedy that the United States Supreme Court has endorsed, is an absolute dismissal of the case with prejudice against re-prosecution. Period, full, stop. It's a dramatic remedy. And so many courts are rushing toward technology as a way of avoiding any speedy trial problems. Although arguably, I don't even think it's arguable, a pandemic is a neutral reason for delay that would not weigh against the government. But I think courts are correct to at least be concerned. The other place that I think we just don't know enough about technology goes back to these very human relationships. We don't really know what happens to the equality of attorney-client confidences when they're done by video. We don't know what happens to the quality of victim communication when victims are communicating with police and with prosecutors by video. And unfortunately, we're finding all of that out in the middle of a crisis. What we do know should give us reason for pause and reason for alarm. One, we know that we don't yet know all the ways in which video can be corrupted and hacked Anybody who's been um, Zoom bombed since we first started in the pandemic knows what I'm talking about. But different technologies have different levels of security. And unfortunately, the more readily available they are, the less secure they often are. Secondly, there's great reason for concern about the privacy and integrity of attorney-client communications. I mentioned earlier that attorney-client communications have often been done by video, particularly in rural communities, and lawyers often speak to their clients by telephone, both in, when they're incarcerated and not. But we have a lot of evidence that those conversations sometimes are monitored and are shared with prosecutors. For those of you who might be wondering, well, has that really happened? Um, I'd encourage you to look at a case coming out of um, Leavenworth, where the federal defender 
um, for the District of Kansas, uh, entered into an agreement with the folks who are operating attorney-client visits, this was a private contractor at the, the prison there, that communications would not be recorded, um, video would not be kept. Turns out that it was both kept, recorded, and shared with the U.S. Attorney's Office. There are more than 100 federal habeas cases now pending in the District of Kansas because the government has refused to disclose information that was demanded in discovery. And therefore the judge, it appears, is going to draw an adverse inference and assume that the US Attorney's Office looked at all of it. If that's what's happening in the federal system, I think it's fair to say um, that we can anticipate similar concerns elsewhere. And we've seen this at other facilities. Um, the Orleans Parish Prison, I think we've seen it in Chicago in the past, there are genuine risks about compromising the fundamental attorney-client relationship. So where does that leave us? I don't have great answers. Um, I think where it leaves us as a criminal justice community, if you look at the whole picture, is with a set of opportunities and a set of obligations. The opportunities are, are robust and they're exciting. We can learn more about arrest rates. We can learn more about incarceration. We can learn more about what happens when we issue summonses and don't bring people to jail. We can also learn an awful lot about what works in criminal justice by identifying and tracking those data points. If we use technology well, we can expand access to justice to people all over the country, assuming we can get them the technology. We can make it possible for people to show up for a brief court appearance without missing a whole day of work. We can reduce the effort and time that public defenders have to spend and the prosecutors have to spend in their cars. In places like Nevada and Washington State and Montana where judges spend hours of time in their car. Nevada puts out, used to put out an annual report on judicial travel because judges spent so much time in their cars. We can really save judicial resources. But we have to be sure that the cost is worth it. It's not gonna be cost free. And I'm not talking here about the cost of the technology, although I think that will be substantial in some in instances. We have to be focused on the cost in terms of quality. We have to be focused on whether we are fundamentally altering the American promise, whether we can in fact provide what the constitution requires in a socially distanced, technologically advanced manner. You know, they've just started grand juries by video in many jurisdictions, and those seem to be going pretty well. But of course, grand juries are secret proceedings. They're not adversarial. So having them on technology, no one gets to show up they're recorded, seems like it might really work. But when we talk about public trials, something I didn't spend any time on today, but most courts are dealing with this by publishing um, the information about where the public can join an online proceeding. What we're talking about with in terms of public trials, attorney-client communications, confrontations, voir dire, I'm, I'm loath to imagine, although I think it may happen, that there are jurisdictions that want to move to all technology jury trials all the time for at least some kinds of cases. And this idea has been bandied about a fair amount. I think we should be very, very vigilant against efforts to move us toward technology in the courtroom as a substitute for in-person activities, as a norm, before there has been a serious, rigorous scientific investigation of how those technologies impact the fairness, the efficacy, and the accuracy of criminal justice proceedings. So I'm gonna stop there. That leaves us about 15 minutes for questions or comments. And I know the chat box is not everybody's favorite, um, but I think it's probably better than listening to me keep talking, so. Well, yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Mesker. So as if you have questions, we would invite you to put them into uh, the Q&A. Um, we've also um, unmuted a few people that uh, that 
you know, might want to ask a question. Good. Um, so we can we can take uh, take questions that way. Um, while people are gathering their thoughts, I will just uh, I'll start. I'll take moderator's privilege with the with a question. But I do. So, uh, <laughs> you talked a lot about uh, you know when we think about technology and access to justice. I think the the narrative is usually that technology can increase access to justice, but you gave a lot of interesting examples where that might not be uh, be the case. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about uh, attorneys and uh, if you are seeing some trends with respect to how they practice either through data or anecdotally about what they are uh, excited about having moved to more uh, digital and technology tools during the pandemic. Because uh, you did talk a little bit about the idea that I can't be face to face with my client and that that hinders uh, some of my ability to represent them. So is there anything that you see that attorneys are actually like, hey, this is this is great. And I, I think I'll use this going forward when we get out of the pandemic. So, you know, what I'm hearing is, I guess there are a couple of different threads. One is, as I said, people who've been doing this a long time. And that's predominantly, to my surprise, in rural areas that have broadband. You talk to defense lawyers and they say, I could not manage my practice without it. Talk to prosecutors in remote areas who say, digital technology is giving me the ability to bring experienced lawyers into my community who would not pick up these cases if they had to come to where I live mm. every single time. So I think there's enthusiasm about that. What we're, what we're seeing anecdotally from, from public defenders though is great concern about the ways in which this inhibits their communication and the relationship building, the rapport. You know, public defenders represent most criminal defendants in this country, and most criminal defendants come to public defenders or appointed counsel with a fair amount of suspicion. Um, when I first started practicing at the Legal Aid Society in New York, I used to have clients who say to me, you know, you're really good at this. Instead of being a legal aid, you should go to law school. And I was full-time public defender. So there's a lot of concern initially that video communications dilute the quality of what is already a very fragile relationship as you're trying to build it. Second concern, as I mentioned, is this enormous concern about confidentiality and communications. I was actually um, in court uh, last week uh, in New Orleans. I was here, court was in New Orleans. And uh, we're all on the screen, and on the screen is a guy from Angola, which is in you know way up in in the Felicianas in Louisiana, so very far from New Orleans. And he's sitting in his counselor's office in the jail, right in the prison. And behind him, the correction staff are walking back and forth, right, meeting. And every once in a while, they're checking in on him. Is it your turn? Is it your turn? Um, that's also the way people at Angola meet with their lawyers. That's of enormous concern for lawyers, right? That's not a meaningful communication. And again, this, this concern about being recorded is increasingly pervasive. Um, you know, and part of that may be good old fashioned, um, but honest public defender paranoia. Um, prosecutors seem to really like this as a way of moving cases forward where they can speak to witnesses and police, but again, feel like they need to be with many of their witnesses. And um, particularly in many of the prosecutor forms, I'm seeing a lot of concern about witness coaching. Okay. So not not as positive as you'd like me to be. <laughs> no, it's okay. Judges love it. Judges <laughs> love it. Office <laughs> managers love it. And again, people are open to possibilities, but I think there's a real suspicion about moving too fast. Got it. Okay, so we got another question in the Q and A that I will ask, and I'll just I'll just read this as it is. As it, as it is written. Uh, so you mentioned the issue of defendants possibly not making required appearances with probation because of not being able to pay a cell phone bill. How does that differ from potentially a defendant not being able to pay a bus fare to meet with a probation officer? Is the appearance requirement normally an issue? So the answer is, it's a question of degree, not kind, right? Presumably your bus fare, depending on where you live, is gonna be anywhere from $1.25 to $2.50. Um, some people don't have that. But a cell phone bill is more substantial and a cell phone bill is not something that is easily paid by scraping up the change from the bottom of your car or the cracks in your cushions. Also for many people, 
they don't control their cell phone bills. If, for example, um, you're in a family that very poor and someone else pays your cell phone bill, your ability to pay that bill may be out of your control. Um, I, I'm not sure I understand the part of the question that asks about is the appearance requirement normally an issue, um, other than to say that in most probation agreements, there is a meeting at a regularly scheduled interval and often a, U, often a urinalysis, right? right? Site visits, et cetera. Those aren't happening so much. And so, um, yes, appearance is usually an issue. And I think the, you know, but, but yeah, the, the bus fare example is a great one. But as I said, it's, it's a problem of degree and not kind. Got it. Okay. All right. So we have another question uh, in the Q&A. So, uh, and this one is from a student I know. So uh, they say, I think one of the advantages of technology and justice is that courts are more accessible to the public. Um, what do you think the effect of courts being accessible through technologies will be long-term, especially for cases that garner a lot of public attention? I think it's gonna be very positive. I think that there's gonna, it's gonna ramp up the pressure on the courts that have been resistant. Um, but I wanna point out that that does not mean that the proceedings themselves have to be remote. What this proves is that courts have the capacity to stream their proceedings and make them available to the public widely without forcing people to come to the courtroom, something that some courts have been doing for a long time if you watched the old court, tree, court TV. But um, I, I think there's also concern that I've heard expressed um, about when, whether courts have the capacity to remember when to turn it off um, there have been reports about difficulties mm. about sidebars, mm. uh, about things that are supposed to be in camera, but, but that's something courts are going to have to work out. I think in general, public access via video is terrific. One big asterisk, which is there's been a lot of conversation about victim crimes, particularly sexual assault crimes and child victims, and whether and to what extent they should be um, made public and preserved in technology the same way other crimes are. Excellent. So one thing I wanted to ask you about is, so um, we had Professor Thornburg in an earlier uh, session and she talked about some of the observations that she had made in observing courts. And one of the things that she said is that there, was, there, there, there wasn't a consensus on if you are appearing in court, let's say you are appearing in court uh, via video, um, you might have, uh, a whole bunch of stuff going on in your background. You mentioned the 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 uh, the, the guy that was in jail right. uh, making an appearance. Um, how big a deal is that? And do you do you see any sort of uh, initiatives on behalf of the court to to make some rules around uh, people's backgrounds or what what people are seeing? Courts. I mean, there have been a couple of you know so there have been some comments, and you see every once in a while a rule about please wear professional attire which presumably means a professional attire we can see. Um, there've been some comments about backgrounds, but it's very difficult to regulate, particularly because people are adapting on the fly. Right. Um, where you really begin to worry about it, I think, and, and there've been these conversations in law school communities. I mean, we've had them as a faculty, as have other faculties, about the way in which video forces people to share information about their personal lives, their families, their homes, the quality of the way they live. That's very, very invasive. Um, I, I have students who cover their backgrounds with a sheet, right? Because they don't want their personal lives to be made public. Um, judges, I think, are not there yet, um, with the exception of, you know, there's the infamous toilet flushing and, the, you know, we've, we've heard about those things. But, but there isn't a lot yet that's been promulgated. The, the other reason is because we don't have great tools. So if you consider that many, many poor people who are appearing by video are going to be using their cell phones, you know, you have to start to ask questions about, for example, is it realistic to put in artificial backgrounds? What about where people are going to be? How mobile are they? Um, background noise is another big one, right? Zoom has a technology that's supposed to smooth out the background noise, but how effective is it? Right. How well does it work? So again, courts are moving toward those things. You'll see a lot of committees that have been formed to study these things. There's also a really interesting study out of Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Lab of all places. It's the second phase of an NIJ study. Um, about courtroom technology, video technology, very prescient study, it was finished in 2019, um, talking about 
um, high level tech requirements and kind of what people's subjective feeling is about what's going on on, on screen and what's happening and what the technical specs of what are, what's happening, right? In terms mm. of how much is actually being communicated versus what people think is being communicated. In right. terms of full range of information, accurate view of what's happening, et cetera. And I think courts are gonna have to grapple with that too. Interesting. So we, all right, so we have another question about data. So uh, this question is, is there any data uh, available that compares the cost of live court to virtual court um, from either the, I guess the jurisdiction standpoint or the defendant standpoint and they give a example, for example, Tele doctor televisits cost less than, right. Or, or should cost less or tend to cost less, do attorney visits cost less? So there's not, I mean, it's too early to really know. I, I will say a couple of things that I, that I think we're gonna have to be thought about. One is um, the technology infrastructure is a little more challenging in the criminal justice context. So for example, if you imagine wiring a correctional facility for video communications, which many facilities have done um, with for-profit companies so that attorney, people can visit with their families at a fee. But if you consider the security concerns, for example, in installing and, and, and setting that system up, they're often more substantial than they would be in a single doctor's office, for example, mm -hmm. if you're wiring a facility. Um, the other thing is many, many public defender's offices and some prosecutor's offices as well do not have the resources for this. So we're not yet able to talk about the cost of visits. We're still talking about the cost of infrastructure. Um, and so the other complicating factor, and I think this must have been an issue in telemedicine, but I don't know, is that in lots of criminal justice systems, um, different stakeholders use different types of software and have different video contracts and different video platforms. Right. And so getting everybody on the same platform has proved to be very challenging. So will it be cheaper? I mean, I think there's, there's no question that you will reduce some costs. Um, if you think, for example, about not transporting inmates, right, people who are in prison from a court, from a jail to a courthouse and back, you will save costs if you're not doing that. Um, what we don't know, and I really want to stress this, is we do not know how that affects outcomes. And it has a damaging effect on outcomes. There are going to be costs on the back end that, that will be potentially of much greater magnitude than the front end savings. Hmm. Now, if you can imagine, if, if judges are making the wrong decision, judges are increasing bail amounts, for example, because they're doing video appearances and people are staying in jail because they can't make the bail amounts. Well, there are costs then to feeding and housing people. There are economic costs to the jobs those people aren't working. Um, there are medical and psychiatric costs. So I think we have to be very holistic in terms of how we think about it. Okay, excellent, excellent. Well, I, I think we are almost out of time and I don't see any more, uh, any more questions in the Q&A. So I just want to thank you for the terrific uh, presentation. Pleasure. Um, and I, I, you gave us a lot to think about and it seems like there are going to be some uh, very interesting, exciting research projects uh, coming out of what, what has happened. So let me make one plug before we yeah. go, which is our own Jenya Turner, our colleague. Um, Professor Turner has written a great paper on remote criminal courts based on some survey data that she collected. And um, that paper is available on SSRN. Um, it's actually one of the um, top downloaded papers right now um, okay. on the criminal procedure SSRN, go Genia. Um, and if folks are interested, it's, it's a very, very timely paper. Um, she moved very fast to get something out there. We're still in the middle of learning, but um, there's a lot of great scholarship coming out and folks should check hers out. Excellent. Um, and so just to, uh, before we go, I just want to tell people that if you are want CLE credit, you can email your Texas bar card number to uh, tycenter at smu.edu, and we will uh, get that process for you. Thank you for joining us today and have a good rest of your week. Again, thank you, Professor Metzger, and uh, it's good to see you. Good to see you too. All right, take care. Bye.